it's such a pleasure now to have all of you. I, I, I it's going to be um, it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful um, experience. I know that for sure. So hello everyone and welcome to EB Speaks. My name is Ibinabo Enebi and I am excited about this episode. I'm delighted about it. Um, just thank you so much for everyone who has joined us on Facebook, on my Facebook profiles, Ibinabo Enebi and my Facebook page, Ibinabo Enebi. And a big shout out to everyone who's joined us on LinkedIn and of course on YouTube. And to those of you who've joined us also from Zoom. And for those of you on Zoom, it's going to be an interactive session. So feel free. Um, you will be given an opportunity to ask questions. And if you're joining the Zoom, sorry, um, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Facebook, write your questions and your comments in the comment box below. And uh, my guests will answer your questions. So today on EB Speaks, I'm continuing the conversation on immigration, and I have termed it the Jackba series. This is the, is it the third now or the fourth installment? No, third installment on the conversation. EB Speaks episode 73 and 74 are all, you know, are all geared towards the immigration story. I also have... Um, an episode I did on um, the things you need to know before you migrate to America and what you need to know before you send your child to Canada. So just check uh, in my YouTube channel, Iminabo and Navy, and also watch those programs. So today I have with me um, experts, the best in the field, and they're here to tell us about how, what you need to know or how to succeed as a migrant professional. I have Rose Demol. Rose, how are you? I'm good. Welcome Thank you, EB. <laughs> yeah. Rose resides in Ireland and is the CEO of International Community Dynamics. She moved to Ireland in, in um, 1980, 1998, and yeah. she's passionate about refugees and immigrants. I have Rose Zimwanza. Rose is originally from Zimbabwe. She resides in Ireland. She's a clinical systems analyst, and she's going to share her migrant stories and the things you need to know to succeed as an immigrant. And I also have Dr. Ayode Adeyemi joining us all the way from Canada. He is a business strategist and management, management consultant, and he's going to tell us again how to succeed as a migrant in Canada. And, <clears throat> and listen, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel, Ibn Aboy Nebi. You can follow me on my social media handles, Ibn Aboy Nebi, Instagram, Ibn Aboy Nebi, uh, TikTok, uh, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And, you know, so welcome. So good to see you. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, just a little bit of a correction there. My name is Ruth Simwanza, and I'm from Zambia. Did I say Zimbabwe? <laughs> okay, my mind was in Zimbabwe. I wrote Zambia. You see. Okay, so Ruth Zam from Zambia. Thank you. So let's talk about what it is to migrate from your country to another country. And the reason why I love this conversation is because all of us here have in one way or the other left our home countries to reside in, in Ireland. So uh, Rose, I wanna hear about your migrant story. Okay, my own, my own yeah, story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, uh, I'm from Belgium, from Brussels and I'm married uh, a Brit who was half Irish, half Welsh. We lived in, in Belgium for many years, but then uh, he found a job in Cork, Ireland. So he had to convince me to move because I didn't really want to. I thought Ireland was a country with hills, white farms and 
and then dancing little girls, but <laughs> I didn't know much about it. I thought there was nothing here, to be honest. So we did come here once to have a look around, and because they had good coffee in Kinsale, I thought, okay, <laughs> I'll give it a try. But um, so we moved in 1998. I had two children. I was seven months pregnant with my third child when we got here. It wasn't easy. Um, and especially I'm European, so that side of things is very easy. Of course, we don't need to ask for visas or anything. We can just come. But um, it's the, the shock, the culture shock, I guess. And also you take things for granted. Where, where I am from in Belgium, everything is quite easy. This, there was childcare, there was uh, a lot of support around. And then at that time here in Ireland, there was no childcare or very, very expensive childcare. Um, the maternity wards, which I needed then were completely different. So it was quite a shock to the system. And um, also a change of language. I spoke English very well, of course, but um, it was, you know, you're not used to seeing everything in English and, and, and it, you miss it after a while. So then also finding work in those days was really hard for me because um, the, the immigration was quite new here and they didn't, I was asked once, do you think with your accent that you can, that people will accept you? <laughs> <laughs> and I was shocked, you know, but yeah, that's so it, it hasn't been easy for me, um, but very, very easy compared to other people. So um, I've been here now 25 years. I must say the only way I feel like I can work is doing it myself, um, setting up my own organization. That's why I set up International Community Dynamics together with other uh, migrants and mostly refugees. It's refugee led. And um, so, yeah, we, we help people to adjust. We help people to, with whatever problems they have. Uh, we also make music. And then when I noticed when people had uh, the right to work in 2018, we decided to help them and we set up Recruit Refugees Ireland. So um, I can tell you so many things I could go on forever about migrating, but uh, yeah, these are the things. Also, what I want to say, and I will repeat it after, uh, is I hadn't really researched what it would be like to live in Ireland. I thought it was all going to be the same as uh, all over Europe, but it wasn't. And so that's one of the things I want to tell people, do your research before you come so you know what you're going into. Okay. Thank you very much. And that is so profound. Mm -hmm. And Ruth, tell us about your migrant story. Um, Ibi, actually, my, my migrant story started at the age of 13. Um, I was born in Zambia. My parents are, were both Zambian, and uh, my father emigrated from Zambia to South Africa, to Johannesburg. And as a 13-year-old with um, my sisters, my older sister and my younger sister, we moved to South Africa with, with our father. Um, it was an interesting time in the history of South Africa because it was right at the brink of independence. Um, so there was a lot going on in the country and it was a very, very scary time. Um, already by then, South Africa was a hostile environment to foreigners. Um, as a 14 year old, I had been harassed at a bus stop and refused to actually access the public transport system because I couldn't speak the language. Um, and that, that actually stayed with me. And on that day, I vowed never to learn to speak a South African language because I decided that if that's how you are, I don't want to communicate with you at your level. Um, so that was the sad part of it. Um, I lived in South Africa for 27 years and the story for me as a foreigner living in South Africa didn't change. Um, it got increasingly worse by then. Obviously, I was an adult. I had been in the corporate world. I had been working in South Africa for like 20 years um, and I had reached the end of the line. Um, affirmative action had become really rife in the country. And the last job I had in the country, I was told I was not South African enough, even though I was a citizen to work in their business. So uh, I couldn't work in the country. Um, it was difficult to access funding for any business as a foreigner because my place of um, native was not South Africa. So it had become a really hostile environment for me and I was forced to run. 
So I ran to Ireland. So Ireland is actually my second home um, away from home, South Africa being one and Ireland being the second. And I came to Ireland as an asylum seeker, um, literally on the run for my life um, because South Africa was no longer safe. And my experience in Ireland has been a little bit different. Um, I'll be honest with you, the asylum seeking process in itself, the way it is designed, is not easy for anybody. I, like Rose, also didn't do any research. I didn't have time to research. I needed to get out because my life was at risk. So um, I came to Ireland and I remember seeing Dublin from the airplane and my heart was filled with so much joy because I had come home. It felt like I was coming home. And I took to Dublin like a fish to water. I loved it. And when I moved to Cork, I hated it. I cried for two weeks. Um, and I found that navigating how things work in the country whilst you're in the country is extremely difficult. Uh, the Irish bless their hearts. They are good people, but they don't explain things on their websites really well. And it can get really confusing. Um, and But when you do actually go and ask for help, there, there are some really helpful people out there that really help you navigate it. Um, so on the whole, I have lived the majority of my life as a foreigner somewhere on the earth and once, you know, in Africa, once in Europe, and I am having a better experience of being a foreigner in Europe than I did in my own continent. That is deep. Thank you. And Dr. Ayode, what is your migrant story? Uh, you're muted. Yeah. You're muted, yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, good day, everyone. And it's good to be here. Um, my migrant story, well, it's, uh, it, it, for me, it looks like totally uncoordinated. Uh, it was not totally intentional. It was circumstantial uh, and it was situational, you know, for reasons. In actual fact, I, I I traveled a lot and I've been to quite a number of countries, Europe, America, you know, uh, Asia. And so I do usually have vacations across different parts of the world. Uh, that's one of the things I promised my family that we would do. But um, uh, when circumstances and situation begin to, you know, uh, happen, so my, my family had, had left, you know, for quite a number of years and uh, I needed to get close to them uh, and I needed to ensure that things are getting right and so when situation begin to look like a challenge uh, in actual fact I had moved to for further my education I was only I suppose I've, I've been pending a certain pro program I've made payment for and I needed to move to go do it and then uh, then it became uh, a challenge as to having to have to extend my you know uh, my you know stay and then uh, I have to get on board to start uh, to, to look at, uh, given the challenges I have, you know, uh, back home and other things, and then begin to start the process. So um, I approach a lawyer to to facilitate the process, and then uh, we begin the journey. Uh, in actual fact, uh, it was a very mixed a, a mixed feeling thing for me. And uh, looking at the, you know, you sometimes you look at maybe you have some element of comfort where you're coming from, and then you you also have some things running for you, and then you have a, a situation you have to make decision, and then it becomes so complex and challenging, and it look like the future. You look at okay, you also need some level of safety, some level of assurance, and your future, and the programs you also have to undertake, and more importantly, family, because uh, when family sets into it, it, it then begins to look like. Um, you need to chew up as regarding your personal aspiration and your family. And so for me, it's more, more of a family and then a safety and then the future, which is actually not, you don't have a, a lot of time again, you know, for some someone, someone in my, you know, of, uh, of my person. So I started the journey and then um, uh, it has been filled with uh, challenges, filled with, uh, you know, difficulties. Uh, not regret natural far, but again, you get to that point and you feel like, um, are you, um, are you on the right path? Are you doing the right thing? Do you, do you want to, 
Uh, somebody say, can say, hear me? Can you hear me? Mm. Uh, me we can all, I can hear you well. Uh, okay. Please let me be sure if you can really hear me. Can somebody confirm? Uh, if, 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 can you confirm to me? Can you hear me? Can you hear him? Like I hear him. Yeah, we okay. can hear okay. him fine. Yeah. yeah. Do you mind just checking? Just checking your microphone. Oh, can you hear me now? I, I, I think I can yeah. hear you. Maybe it's just Tinu's um, own network. I can hear him as well. Oh, okay, the other great. ladies Thank were you. perfectly audible. I can barely hear you, sir. Oh, okay. So uh, I don't know. Everybody can hear me, but uh, you might. Uh, okay. Let's see. Okay. So um, and I, I face it and I face the, the challenges uh from uh, getting to settled to look i mean trying to get your career uh, you know uh, navigate your career and all of that and but i can tell you it's a continuous uh i mean it's a continual progressive journey it's interesting it's a new experience altogether but uh you know god has also been faithful you can't take away the g factor in actual fact and uh it has been an interesting one for me, but uh, of course, yes, uh, still hoping for much, much opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I needed you all to talk about your migrant stories because uh, it's important that our viewers are able to connect with you to know that you know exactly what you're talking about. So from the look of things, you're all settling, you're working, you're doing what you like, but it wasn't always like that. And that's why our, our topic for today is how to succeed as a migrant um, professional. So we're gonna look at two categories of people. First, the first categories of people we're gonna look at are people who are in their countries of origin or currently residing in their home countries and they're like, oh, I want to leave my country to another country because I feel that I have no more opportunities in my country. And also we're going to look at people who are already living in the foreign country, but are trying to find their feet. So assuming somebody is thinking about leaving their home country to say Canada or Ireland, what would you say to that person? I mean, when I mean leaving, I mean leaving their countries for better work opportunities. What are you going to say to that person? I'll start with you, Rose. Yes, so um, <clears throat> I think, first of all, as I said before, do your research, okay? So you you want to go to a certain country. If you don't know which country yet, it's going to be a difficult one because you need to know where you can go with your qualifications, what you can do there, and, and what are the steps to take to get uh, the work permit and, and all those things. So in some countries, you, you will need a visa. In others, you might not. In some countries, some qualifications are accepted and others are not. So these are really very, very important things that you have to check. Um, for Ireland, there is a, a website the, of the immigration service, for example, where if you want to have the highest chances of getting a, a visa, um, they have a list of all the critical skills that are needed in Ireland. So if you have one of those critical skills, you will get a visa quite quickly, but you first have to find work. Okay, you find work, you get a visa, you come and work here. Then there are some other special rules attached to it. And I, I could go on about this for a long time, but it's quite complicated. So you, you need to research that really, really well. Know what you are, what you can do and how you should be going about it. So there are various uh, websites where you can look for work. Um, can you give us examples? I'm sorry to cut you short. Yeah. Can you give us examples as um, examples of the various websites where you can look for work? Because people want to know that. Yeah, I was going to. Uh, yeah. So there's one that's called Moon, uh, Monster, monster.ie. And uh, they like working with people from abroad as well. So monster.ie. Then there is jobs.ie is another good one. 
uh, what is it, irishjobs.ie is another one. Um, and then there are all the uh, recruitment agencies, but if those three are already a good way to start. So I would say monster.ie, jobs.ie, and uh, job, irishjobs.ie, they are very, very good. And there you can type in what your qualifications are and the jobs will come up, okay? And then uh, you take it from there. So um, critical skills, they change very often, but one of the jobs that are always in the critical skills list will be nurses, caretakers, and anyone in the medical field. So radiographers as well, doctors, of course. Um, there's a big, big um, need for doctors and nurses here and for caretakers. So that's one. Then uh, a lot in the IT industry. There are a lot of jobs there on the critical skills as well. Construction is another one. Um, engineering, they need engineers of all kinds uh, in Ireland as well. So construction engineers as well as IT engineers, uh, software developers, all those things. So, but it's a long list and, and it changes. So have a look at it and, and, and that is where you can start. You know, if you see I have one of these qualifications or you can upskill and, and get one of the qualifications and then uh, go for it. I think it's much better to do that. So, um, and then of course, research what your obligations are, what your, how the country works and all that, but that's after you found the job and you know that you can leave before to get the visa, make sure you're well informed on what you can do. And uh, so you don't, you're not sent back on the same plane that you came from, okay? Okay, so someone says, please, can the names of the websites be dropped? Okay, I'll drop them. Now, yeah. uh, Ruth? Um, I would actually encourage people, if, if you're coming on a work visa and you've identified a country that you want to go to, I suggest that you go visit the country. Mm. Go and have a look. Go and see, because um, culture shock is really real. And... Um, for some people, it can actually even register as a trauma. Um, mm. So you need to you need to be careful. And if you're in the southern hemisphere, and you're coming to the northern hemisphere, my advice is come in winter. Come in winter. <laughs> come and experience the cold. Um, especially for us Africans, we don't have winters like we have winters here in the north. Um, for example, in Canada, it snows really heavily in the winter. Dr. Ayo will tell you that. Um, and I, I remember the first time I experienced minus 34 degrees, mm -hmm. I, I was ready to see my savior. I was like, yeah, Lord, I can come home today. It's okay. Um, and then you come to Ireland where it rains the entire winter and it's extremely windy. And I come from a place where our winters are dry. So, um, by January, I start to take the weather personally. And I get really upset and really weepy and I don't want the rain anymore. And I don't want the wind in my face anymore. Um, I, I like joking saying that if I had known that Ireland was an island, I wouldn't have come because the wind is be constantly beating at us, you know? So I encourage you because your environment matters. Your environment matters. Um, I now live in a country where 90% of the time I don't want to go outside because it's wet you know, but it's raining all the time in Ireland. So I've had to come to terms with that um, where socially I have to be social. I can't just stay at home the whole time. Mm -hmm. I have to go out and see people. It's good for my mental health. I have to, you know, this is what I have to do as a human being. So I force myself, even when it's going out, I comfort, it's raining. I say, you know, it's it's just a little rain. I won't die. It's just a little rain. I would so melt. I encourage you to actually go visit the country, go in the winter and don't go over Christmas because Christmas is deceptive. Mm. It's happy over Christmas. There's lights everywhere and <laughs> everyone is nice. No, go just before Christmas or go after Christmas, but go and experience the winter because that will determine whether you will actually want to live there or not. Fantastic. And um, Dr. Ayo? You're on mute. Sorry. Uh, all right. So uh, if I get the question again, uh, how do you migrate? Am I right? Yes. Yeah. So what? Yeah. 
what's your advice? If you're going to Canada, oh. what's the first things first? If you're going to Canada for work, what's the first things first? Rose says, do your re research to, to make sure that your qualifications yeah. are accepted. Yeah, I, I, I had them very well. I had them. I just want to be sure that uh, that is the line of talk. Okay, so my first, uh, you know, uh, approach or reaction to that would be, uh, you know, in Nigeria, we say Jaguar, you know, Jaguar, Jaguar, Jaguar. All right. So, of course, yes, uh, you, that's the narrative. But uh, I think you need to uh, be very uh, intentional about your Jaguar. You, see. you need to be hmm. very, very intentional about it. Uh, yes, there are a lot of challenges in the country. There's a lot of issues. There's a lot of reasons why people want to escape, all right, or try to find green pasture. So, but you must be very intentional to know what is that you are doing. And of course, you know that different routes to it, but especially that of the, you know, schooling, you know, which is, seems to be the uh, getting the higher attractions and then the next one that with your PR. Okay, so because that's also we form. On, I mean, we, we define the basis of how you, when you land and then how you approach things, right? So the first thing is, how do you arrive? Okay, so your arrival or your, your route of arrival determine a whole lot of things. So if you come in with your PR, that are, I mean, your landing, that's the way it works. If you come in as a student, your landing, that way it works. And if you are coming as a refugee, too, your landing, that's the way it works. So all of that, you need to do a thorough research. To have, I can't speak about all of that right now, even though I have information around that. But essentially, essentially, and I like one of, one of my friends was going to come around. He asked me some few questions. And I said, OK, right from why you are in Nigeria, let me link you to some platforms. OK, start making friends. Start hearing things yourself. And especially when the province you are going, you know, like Ruth said, it can be cold. Yeah. I, I came in the winter. I, I've been traveling to Canada. I mean, I've tried Canada about three times. I've experienced the winter, but maybe not the tick, because before you get tick, I ran away, usually. So, but this time around, I came, you know, uh, I think in the winter, yeah, that should be around uh, November. So I was in it, and I experienced it. I, so I, But, you know, I felt, okay, yeah, this is the real winter. I saw it, I, I saw the one that I was, we were driving, and it was not going to take the car away from us. We saw the one that we were just on the road and suddenly the snow started to pour and then the car was not going to move. I saw an accident right in the window. So, but, but eventually I realized that, okay, so uh, I then need to begin to adapt myself as a person. So you need to prepare for that. If I must be honest with you, the winter jacket I thought I used in UK was not going to be relevant here. So I threw it away. Okay, so when the winter was getting to it, I went to the mall to get a winter coat. The day I got it, by the time I got home, I realized that the winter cool was not going to work. I returned it back the following day, go and get it. So, of course, there are going to be things like that that you're going to, you know, hmm. uh, experience. So, you must be really prepared. Let me tell you, an average in Nigeria, whatever you are buying in Nigeria as a winter code, is just a line number. So, don't don't rely on it. When you get there, you, you will understand, you know. So, that, again, you should experience. And so, but one thing that is important is that you should understand your own, your person, your your... Your, in terms of your health wise, and then be able to don't don't flaunt and feel like look, I'm in the foreign country, I'm in abroad, and you want to feel like more, you want no. Please, because it's very important, like I tell people, when you break down, when your when your body metabolism breaks down, all your goals will be go, will go down the drain. So keep yourself, prepare for it. You know, you might have people saying though, oh, I, I have people that they will throw off their clothes and they wear something light. I won't, I won't no, look, I won't deceive myself. I know. Who I am, I know where I'm coming from. No matter how number of years I'm going to spend here, I don't know whether I'm going to be able to tell you that I want to expose myself to winter. But I told people when it's uh, summer now, I said we are going to wear the bomb shirt together. We're going to wear the short knicker together. Now I'm going to enjoy. It. So right now I wear almost my my short everywhere. So now this is summer. So before the winter come, I want to enjoy myself. So prepare for that. But again, information information is very important, and that's some of the things I I suffer. You know, because when you land. There are things that you need to do almost immediately. And I will share this story. Okay, you know, please do. I, I was running away from getting credit card because I felt I don't want to use credit card. I want to be able to, you know, comport myself, work with whatever I get. Unfortunately for me, not knowing that I was just going to mess myself up. So I got to a point, I was going to get something and you tell me, Where's my, I don't have a credit history. I said, yes, sir, because I'm not, no, no, they say it doesn't work that way. So. I realized that I had to go back and have process the credit card. But it was already like six months late. And so I had to wait for another like three months and six months before 
I could begin to build my credit. So things like that, information is very important. So I, I think get the right information, get the right, don't get on to when you get here before you get the information. You could go online, you could ask people, uh, and then, like I said, you could f- look for people that will help you get some platforms and get information. And then and your it, documentation. So, doc, Dr. Aya, I'm sorry to cut you short, but tell us what are the platforms? Because some people want to know, like, you know? Okay, so th- again, this is a challenge, okay? Uh, and I won't lie to you. There are platforms that are, uh, they've given people uh, overseas, people that have not landed opportunity to be part of the platform and that they abused. All right, so okay. for instance, there are, there are platforms that Nigerians, because you're going to, when I came, I mean, I'm still using my Nigerian number because I won't take it away so for some obvious reasons. Uh, and I use my Nigerian number, they yanked me off. They said they thought I'm Nigerian. And because some people have deep, I mean, I had a story about two days ago, and that's why I want to explain this. The guy needed to convert Naira to dollars, and then somebody reached out. Unfortunately, the person was using Nigerian number, and then the guy was duped. So there are issues like that. But of course, on recommendations, there are platforms on Telegram, there are platforms on WhatsApp. The one on Telegram I see a bit flexible. I mean, if you reach out to me, I could be, give you some you know, link to that, the one I know. And this platform takes care of, I mean, entire province, so it doesn't matter where you are. You know, in Canada, you will get to get one or two information. People, you know, interact. But I could share it where you've been able to, so you can pull it out. But I wouldn't want to, you know, say now. All right. Okay. But on, on, on Telegram, you could you could get some information like that. There are some on Facebook. There are Facebook that you could you could search, right, and look at some platform. People discuss about things that are happening, you know, in Canada, especially your province that you want to get into. You may also, look, you know, Canada is very big. Yeah. Unlike unlike Highland, unlike I like Highland and uh, some other you know prior country, it's too big. And the the interesting thing is that even within Canada, of course, there are different time zones based on whatever you belong to. So those also also matters. Okay. And the funny thing, when I'm going to talk about about career, about your job search, which is another interesting thing. Uh, you know, like I've discovered when I got here, I was thinking I'm just going to roll into my HR portfolio career path that I've been, I've been used to. So I realized that, okay, of course, it's natural that there will be certification. But the more interesting thing is that they, 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 there are a lot of skills that are on bond do, right? Hmm. So like back home, you probably get more of generalist, generalist roles. But yeah, there are a lot of more skills that are on bond do. More, more fundamentally, the province have their own different certifications. Okay, so you, if, for instance, in Nigeria, we have uh, 36 states, all right? So and the same equal certifications, all right? If you charter member of the personnel manager, it works across the taxi state. But like here, if you're Ontario, Ontario has its own regulation. So other province have So you now find out that, okay, so depend on where you are and that's why you have to find out what is obtainable, right? So so that you won't, don't do a certification for another province if you're not going to live in that province. I mean, it's important. So you need to get that. So, and then again, be, be flexible with yourself because the truth is, there will be that need for you to either upskill or even that skill. <laughs> I don't know if that word works. Your some of your, you know, your your career that you feel like, okay, except this, I'm not going anywhere. So that again is another part. I'll speak to that maybe later on as we go get into the discussion. But what I'm saying, by and large, is that information is the first thing, very important. Where you are going exactly, you need that information, the very information that will help you, you know, to, to settle down. And then uh, again, don't 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 lose it. Don't lose it that look, even though people say it's not easy, it's tough, but don't think then uh, there won't be always be possibilities because my examples. I, what did I do for myself? Of course, like I, and I must be honest with you, for the very greater part of my, I mean, I was I wasn't working for the very, very greater part of the early days. You know, I wasn't working, but luckily I still do a bit of volunteer. I get into the system, so I attend events. Okay, so when I attend That's events, networking, I, yeah, yeah, networking. So I, I mm-hmm. feel like I want to understand the culture, understand the terrain, know what happens there. So people begin to identify with me. Unfortunately for me, I can't hide, so I contribute. Okay, so up to point somebody spotted me. I said, "You're going to be our MC." I said, "Have you seen me doing one before?" I said, "Okay, maybe this is one way to get." So, you know, I start getting involved in activities, network with so many organize. I mean, business, uh, not businesses really, in a grouping, and I attend some rather than just sitting there and feeling like I don't have a job. I, I just create something for myself, right? And I keep on building myself. 
you know, even some free courses online that you could do, all right? And then the one you can pay for. Because I look at, okay, what I want to do, I need to invest in myself again. And I must not lie to you, that made me to even speed up my project management course. It cost me about $1,500 US dollars, but I look at, I needed to do this. You know, I, I wanted to do it back home, but right now I think it was very important for me. And then uh, again, you need to also, if you don't have friends, then you need to also identify who really you want to make your friend. Okay, because of course, you know, people have different vision, people have different information, people have different level of exposure. So that is very important. I have a friend that told me, you know, if I say family, I've known them before I arrived, we've been doing things together. And then they hosted me in their house and the wife spoke to me a lot. He said, look, when she arrived, she was a dentist from Nigeria. And when she arrived, okay, uh, people telling her to go for, you know, uh, dishwash, you know, all of those things. And she was doing it because she didn't really want to get settled. And she got to a point, she said to herself, that, look, but this is not what I wanted to do. If I'm a dentist from Nigeria, I should be able to offer more value than this. And then she spoke to herself and challenged herself. And then she, that was when, because if you care is not taken, why you can do those to start up? You might get embedded into it and then feel that that's the only alternative way you have. So I just want to say to you that, look, you can't do those things. It's not bad. But don't limit yourself, reduce yourself, and feel like, okay, accept this, then you can't do any other thing, all right? Fantastic. It can be tough. It can yeah. be tough, but of course, there's possibility. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Sorry, now let me just, uh, yeah. Okay, so back. So yeah, now we have extensively talked about if you're in your home country and you're thinking about coming overseas to live, to work. We've talked about that. So it says here, the most important thing for you to do, you have to research, which is important. Um, you have to, um, yeah, do your research to make sure that your qualifications are accepted. That's important. Research, research, research. Now, let's talk about the ones that are already here and are lost and th th there's one thing that i want to say that a lot of us don't know a lot of us who are living uh, um, at home don't know that living abroad is not living in heaven that it is tough you can lose your mind mm -hmm. if you don't take time you can lose your mind so you can end up doing the things that you never anticipated you're going to do. You could be a lawyer, an accountant, a doctor, and end up working, doing jobs that you never anticipated that you were going to do. Because sometimes if you don't find your, yourself, it can break you. And I can see all of you nodding, yeah? So you're here and uh, you've left your home country, you've been here for a while. How can you succeed? How do you succeed? I'll start with Rose Day. Let's start with the CV, just writing the CV. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I, I first want to say there are many people here who have come here as refugees and uh, who were not planning to come here. So it's already um, very difficult when you have to run away, leave everything behind and just go. Um, and then you arrive in a country that you don't know. It's not like these people choose where they're going. They just arrive where they can, you know, where they will be accepted as refugees. So that is, they have not thought about preparing to find work. So that's where we come in with our Recruit Refugees Ireland. To, uh, since people had the right to work, they got the right to work since 2018 here in Ireland, before they couldn't even work, so it was even worse. But uh, you live in an environment where it's more like an open prison, uh, a refugee camp, let's say, um, with very, very little income. Uh, a lot of the men want to send, and, and women as well, send money home, and so they need work and they will take anything. Okay, and um, there, that's what makes my blood boil when people, when I hear that a journalist is mopping the floors or um, 
you know, I know a marketing specialist who's cleaning the toilets in a supermarket or things like that. It's just so wrong, so wrong. But it is understandable that people just say, OK, I'll just take what's there. OK, so um, first of all, yeah, we were talking about CVs and that is one thing that I've noticed. So we set up a website for refugees, really, to find work. And uh, we asked them to send us their CVs. And as professional as they may be, the CVs are always wrong. Always. We always have to reshape them. OK, because CVs are different in any country. So and that is also important if you if you're looking for work from from African countries as well as here. Um, I know in Nigeria, uh, the, the CVs that I've seen from people coming from Nigeria, for example, and most African countries, are pages and pages and pages long and um, epistles, you know, you, it's nearly like reading a book. <laughs> but that's not what they want here. They want just headlines, okay? And um, uh, any CV that's longer than two pages is thrown in the bin. So you can, and many people tell me, I don't know, nobody's answering me and all that. It's because their CV is wrong. Also, you do not put a picture on the CV because that is illegal here in Ireland. You cannot do it because it could uh, cause prejudice and, and all that. So you need to not put a, a photo on. Learn to write very briefly what you've done. But what you must start with is a little, um, a tiny little blurb about yourself where you really, really, really boast about everything you can do all your skills and all that you put that in a few lines and then underneath you put uh, your studies and and where you've worked before without any more explanation because they will ask you that at the interview okay they will ask you more about that um also yeah that is a, a very big thing then people who have been here who have not been lucky who have been in direct provision direct provision for those who are not in ireland is where the, it's like refugee camps okay um very often i i notice that they've lost confidence completely and that is what dr ayo adeyemi was saying as well that uh, you need to stick to who you are okay believe in yourself and even if you are mopping the floor don't forget your aim. Your aim is to become who you really should be and, uh, and, and to do the things that you can do and not just spend the rest of your life cleaning the floor for someone or, or things like that, okay? And what I notice now in Ireland is that many people have given in to these things and um, the, the new caretaking uh, population in Ireland is now the black population. It's a bit like the maids in, in America, and it really upsets me. Um, and then the security agents are all refugees as well. So that's good if you want money, stick to that. But please do not forget that you are worth a lot more than that, OK? And um, yeah, so that is a, a big thing, working on your confidence. If you come from a refugee background, sometimes trauma is unspeakable nearly. Go and find help, okay? There is mental health care here. Go and ask for help. Go and find a counselor, speak it out, but do not give up on yourself. And then what I also want to um, stress is that you should never pretend that you're not Nigerian or try to be Irish or try to be someone else. You are who you are. And that is also noticeable in, in interviews. Don't try to be someone else. Be yourself. It's very important that you are honest and, and open about who you are and, uh, and what you really want to achieve. So I think those are and find, look for help, look for help. I mean, we are there to help people and we are happy to, to help anyone. You know, you have to have the courage to ask for help because we can't find any, everyone just like that. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I don't want to overflog um, no. Dr. Ayo and Ruth to talk about, uh, you know, the CV thing because you deal directly with immigrants, be the um, asylum seekers, refugees and immigrants. So you kind of like know that the CV is critical, that we should try to curtail our CVs to what the host countries want. 
yeah. epistles, Absolutely. books, as CVs are not necessary. And I suppose, Dr. Ayo, that it's the same way in Canada as well. Yeah, it's the same way. But if you permit me to just add just one uh, okay, uh, do that, uh, yeah. advice. And, um, you know, of course, you know by now that one, one CV or resume doesn't fit all. So mm. you need to, mm. in, Can in Canada, you need to be, to make your yeah. CV reflect the exact job you are applying for. And I'm also saying this from experience. Um, here, the, I mean, your CV, two pages, like she said, but here, you also need to ensure that your qualification, in fact, here, your qualification probably plays second role. Your, your skills, your competencies will come first, you know, even when you articulate that on your CV. And they want to see what you have done in the past, what you are doing now. All right, that is more, more of it. And then your qualification, especially when you are having to, I mean, I must say to you, I removed the PhD from my CV <laughs> at a point because it was looking intimidating. And then obviously the number of years of experience too can be very intimidating for them. And why? Some of the people that are going to be your boss bosses are just some of them are diploma, some of them are first degree. So when you see you having two degrees, three degrees, and having a PhD, then they feel like, oh, this is uh, it's too much for the portfolio. So you might need to be very circumspect as to what position you are applying for. I'm not saying you hide your information, but just be very sensitive to what you are applying for. I do I did that at the early stage when I wasn't getting any invite, I removed it. And then I started getting invites and I started running interviews. Okay, so that is very important. Now, age is not a barrier. Even though you are not going to disclose it on your CV, I see that it's not totally a challenge. But what can be a challenge is your number of years of experience. So if you put 20 years of year of experience, it can be intimidating. And then again, mm -hmm. you might not get the invite. Okay, so you need to be very uh, sensitive to those things. So that's how I'll drop it there. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I just want to add that as well. Don't put your date of birth on the CV. Some of us, sure, some sure, of us are sure. dying that. <laughs> and also no, don't, don't put it. your it's address. You don't need to put your address. You just say in Ireland or in Cork or whatever. Um, yeah. But also, what was I going to say? Yeah, as Dr. Ayo said, um, adapt your CV to the company you're writing to. And first of all, research the company so you know what they want. And also in, in, in job adverts, you see certain catchwords, use them in your CV. If they, you know, if they say um, something like uh, some empathic, whatever, use empathic because sometimes the CV goes through a computer and it picks out the keywords, okay? Mm -hmm. If those keywords are not in your CV, you will not get an interview. Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, so, 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 sorry, sorry. If you pardon me, just one point. Now, from what she uh, she just said, you know, uh, here we use more of eight years. So, if your CV is nowhere articulated, the eight years will not be able to absorb your information. How do I mean What's by that? What's eight years? Now, so your 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 CV will be automatically transformed to some of those platforms. Will be I mean, your information rather. So, your CV has a pattern that it has to to be written. So, it will be automatically, you know. Uh, transmitted to the, you know, the job site, right? For instance, if you go to indeed.ca and you apply for any position, it will ask you to upload your CV. Once you upload your CVs, it will automatically fill some of the, the data entry, uh, you know, uh, points for you. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean by the ATA. So automa automation, the CV yeah, are automation, yeah. automation, automated. So if it does not align with those, uh, you know, um, flow or pattern, it will be difficult to automate your CV. And then that, again, will be another challenge for you. So that's, you, that's you also you need to be very careful. Okay, fantastic. So viewers, feel free to leave your comments and your questions. If you're watching via Zoom, um, YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn. So now that's, the, that's about the, the, the CVs. Now let's talk about, um, let's talk about the, office the you know soft skills office politics let's talk about that because um you know like i would just say this like in in nigeria you know sometimes and this happens like you're working and your friend can just come and visit you and you'll be on the phone you can
can just say, okay, I'm going for lunch with my friend and it can take like one hour. <laughs> and, you know, but it's not like that here. And it's also important that you respond to your emails as soon as possible, you know? So let's talk about those kinds of things. So I'll start with uh, uh, Ruth. Uh, Ibi, uh, so I had the, 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 the opportunity and the privilege to work um, in a nursing home. And um, that was quite an experience. It wasn't um, like any place I've ever worked before. I worked there as a cleaner. And then after a while, I, was, um, I got the job at reception and that was shortly before I left. Um, so each industry we have to be aware of, and I'm sure it's the same everywhere in the world. Each industry has got its own type of politics. Okay, so when I was working as a cleaner, I was working with people who are professional cleaners, all right? So this is something that they have been doing for the last 10 years. They've been doing it for the last 15, 20 years. They've been in this job, in this house for the last seven years. They know the job well, they know the, they, they know the ins and the outs, there's nothing you can tell them. Um, but then they have a certain mentality and in a work environment, the mentality of the people is actually what drives the politics. So now hmm. I come in with my, with my background and my work history. I've never cleaned anything except my own kitchen and my house. And I'm not given to the kind of politics that they are purporting, that they are pushing. Okay? So I'm not participating in that. So now I'll leave that. I leave the nursing home. Um, and now I'm working in a hospital and even though I'm in IT, I'm sitting in an admin department and it's a completely different environment. The politics are there, but I don't lend myself to the politics. <laughs> I don't have time for politics. <laughs> so I go to work to work. I don't go to work to gossip. I don't go to work to know who's doing what. I'm not interested in any of that. That is actually just my personality type because even in Johannesburg, I was the same. I don't do politics. If there's work to be done, let's do the work and get it done. So I would encourage anybody who's going into any work environment, be who you are. Be who you are. If you are a gossiper, go ahead and you know, you'll deal with it with your God later. If, if Just be who you are. Don't go into an environment like Rose was saying earlier and try to conform and change and try to fit in. Be who you are, because when you are who you are, it's easy for you to stick out. It's easy for you to be called out to actually better things. How does a cleaner go from being a cleaner to being a receptionist? How did you that yourself. happen? Yeah. How did, how did it happen? It happened because when I'm, when I'm spoken to, I'm not speaking at the level of, oh, I can't believe that somebody stole my mop. Oh, wow. No, I'm talking about, okay, if people are stealing mops, then it means there's a problem. There's a shortage of mops. Can we get more mops? All of a sudden, my boss is looking at me different and wondering, okay, why does she think like that? Why isn't she sitting at this person stole my mop, I'm going to get them back for what they did. Because those are the politics in the cleaning department, believe it or not. And these are adult women, adult men that talk like this. So when it comes to politics, go into the environment, observe the environment. What is the culture of the people, the culture of the working environment? If it doesn't suit who you are as a person, who you are as a profession, who you are as at your core, do not participate. Just be who you are. Because if, say, for instance, you're a lawyer and you're working as a cleaner, what good does it do you to start engaging in politics at a cleaner level? And I don't mean to degrade anybody. It's just a reality. So stand your ground and just continue being who you are. Your good nature will speak for you and then you will be called out. And that's how a cleaner becomes a receptionist. Fantastic. Now, I, now hold on there. Now, I want to ask you another question. And I had to quote that um, on my social media handles. You talked about the spiritual nature of 
immigration. And um, guys, I'm going to come back to you, but I want to quickly ask this question before I forget. You talked about the spiritual nature of immigration. You said that if you are an immigrant, that you have to honor the people and honor the land. I want us to talk about it before we, um, we lose track of that. Yeah. How so? And what are the benefits of it? Okay. So um, I'm going to speak to it from a Christian's point of view, because I'm a Christian. Immigration is spiritual, okay? Why do I say that? The first immigrant in the Bible that we see is Abraham. Abraham was called by God to leave the land of his people, to go to a different land. He was going to go live among foreigners. So immigration, whether we like it or not, is spiritual. If you're sitting in your home country right now, and you have this incredible sense that you have to get out of your country, it's probably a call from the spiritual realm that you have to leave. And it's all about destiny. Now, when you get to where you are going, and I'm particularly speaking to my African brothers and sisters, when we come with our degrees and we come with our experience, and we come with the cars that we left behind at home that you used to, we used to drive. We come with an attitude and an arrogance and we come with a pride. Because Africans, that's how we are. When we achieve, we become very arrogant. We become very proud. Okay. The land in Europe is not interested in any of that. The land in Europe, it doesn't care what you did how many operations you did in your home country, how many lives you saved, it doesn't care. Any land actually doesn't care. When you enter a land, you have to honor the land. How do you honor the land? By being humble. Humble yourself and conform to the laws of the land. If say, for instance, I come from a country where stealing is legal and I come into Ireland where stealing is illegal, just because I was the best thief in, in Zambia doesn't mean I can come and continue that. And then they won't stop me because, hey, me, where I come from, I was the best at what I was doing. No. I have to come here and I have to observe, okay, what is the nature of these people? And I have to conform. My first volunteer job in this country, I, I, I worked for um, Tidy Towns. Being a street picker, we used to pick litter up off the street, and I did it purely for volunteer sake. And a friend of mine asked me, says, Ruth, why, why are you doing that? I said, because I want, to know, I want Ireland to know that I care that she's clean. <laughs> this is deep. Yes. I said, because I want Ireland to know that I care that she is clean, that people mustn't litter. They mustn't leave plastic and cans and all sorts of things on the street because mother nature doesn't like it. And I said, if I bless the land, the land will bless me. Because that's how it works. So if I come here with an attitude of, I know better than the government, the government is stupid because where we come from, that's how we talk about our own governments. We wonder why Africa is in shambles. This and that is not working. And they did this because they're unfair. And you accuse them of racism. I always laugh when other Africans talk about racism, live in South Africa, and then tell me about racism. And all sorts of things, none of it. I came into Ireland in 2019. I found people in the direct provision centers. When I got there, they were telling me they'd been there six years. I was in the system two years and eight months. And I left and they are still there. Till now. Yes. But watch the language of these people. You know, that woman there at the center, she's very horrible. Oh, she's a very stupid woman. How can she talk to me like that? That's how they talk about those people that look after them, that make sure that they are fed and that their rooms have got heating. You're not going to get anywhere with that kind of attitude. You're not going to get far. And when you actually do get into a job, you get there, your attitude is the same. Your boss is stupid. Your boss, you know better because you've got a degree and you did this. No one cares. The land does not care. 
All the land knows is if you are here, are you here to serve me? And you cannot serve from a place of pride. We all serve from a place of humility. So if you come here with your attitude, the land will reject you. Mark my words. I have seen it countless of times. The land will reject you. You have to conform and you have to drop your pride and you just have to submit. And then the land will bless you. When you talk to the locals, talk to them with honor and respect. They have literally, you have come into somebody else's house. How do you come into my house and then start to throw your weight around? Mm -hmm. I was having that conversation with my husband today, actually. So you can't do that. When you come into my house and you start to throw my weight around, what am I going to do? I'm going to ask you to leave. Yeah. And this is what is happening on a spiritual level with a lot of my brothers and sisters. Because they have their arrogance and they have their dishonor in their hearts. And then they wonder why a lawyer is mopping floors. Check your heart. Check your heart. If you have a God, talk to your God. Find out what is going on. I would recommend my God because my God is awesome. I would recommend that you sit down and you introspect and find out why is there so much resistance? Why is there so much resistance? What am I fighting against? What do I need to change in order for me to be received? And another question to ask is, should I really be here? Did I miss the mark? Maybe I'm not supposed to be in Ireland. Maybe I'm supposed to be in Poland. Immigration is spiritual. Thank you so much, Ruth, for that. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, let's go back to office, to the office. And um, Rose? Mm -hmm. You are a recruitment um, expert and you've recruited dozens and scores of um, refugees. And what is, what is the office culture that people who are coming in from other countries ought to understand in the Irish uh, work space? Yeah, again, it's, um, it's something that we were not prepared for when we started recruit refugees. Um, these are things that I've learned in the course of, of what we've been doing. It's three years now. Um, we, for example, placed people in jobs, were very, very happy, but then things happened. So, for example, they would get sick and not call the job to say, I'm not coming today because I'm sick. Um, and that's that's totally acceptable. You can call and say, I'm sick, and they will accept it and say, okay, you can stay home. But if you don't call, that's where problems start. And we've had people losing their jobs because of it. But then, of course, also, I mean, here everyone speaks English, but, um, you know, a lot of refugees come here and don't speak English. So I think what Ruth is saying is right, but accepting Migrants is also a duty of ours, especially refugees. And I think as a country who's receiving them, we also need to do better, okay? So there are uh, there are arguments on both sides. Um, but first of all, in the office, learn the rules. And as Ruth says, get a bit used to what it's like to work here. Um, I myself, as a, as a worker before, as an employee, and um, I've, I've done loads of things I could write about a, a big telephone directory about it, but um, um, I'm a bit of a rebel. So if you work in an American company, please keep your mouth shut when you don't agree <laughs> and they watch you. Okay. So I was, for example, working in a call center and I was talking on a chat with my coworkers just thinking it was between us. And I was saying, it's about time we get a union here because things were really going pear-shaped. And (laughs) two seconds later, there was a manager standing next to me asking me to go for a coffee and talk this through, you know? So um, you need to know that you're being watched in these big companies. They're watching you. It's micromanagement, they call it. You know, you get two minutes to go to the bathroom. Don't take three minutes and stuff like that. So make sure you know exactly what you can and can't do if you want to keep your job. And then just be yourself. I always agree with that. Be yourself. Show them what you can do. Um, 
and, uh, and, and you will move on. But, and here's the but that Ruth didn't talk about. We are in a white country and being black always means you have to make an extra effort. So if the white person works an hour more, you as a black person probably have to work three hours more to be noticed and accepted that you might be better than the other. You know, you always have to do that little bit more. And I will never forget uh, reading Chimamande and Gotsi uh, Achiki or whatever Adiki uh, saying when she arrived in America, it was the first time she realized she was black. It's the same yes. here, okay? Uh -huh. And uh, racism does exist. Um, you have to not go screaming and shouting, but you have to know it. And, and, you know, and it is a fact that as a black person, you need to do that little bit more. I've known uh, an engineer who was hired in a company. They sacked him, which according to me was illegal, saying he doesn't fit in. Now, what did that mean? His color didn't suit the other color. That's all it was. So you do have to know that, you know, and you have to be uh, a diplomat, I guess, to be able to deal with these things. Don't get furious, don't get angry, but if it's really wrong, you do have to go and say it, okay? There's always someone in an HR company that if you have a complaint, you can go to them and make the complaint and be very serious about it because those things like saying he didn't fit in, actually you can take it to the Work Relations uh, Commission and uh, you would get compensated for that, okay? But um, to, yeah, that's what I'm saying, to keep on going, just be yourself, work hard, don't get your friends in for coffee. <laughs> if your lunch is half an hour, take half an hour and not an hour and a half, um, all those things. In some jobs I've noticed in hospitals sometimes when, when it's not very busy, they don't mind if you stay a bit longer, but if it's an office environment, um, do, you a know. Call center, a call center environment as well. And, oh, you, oh, you can't, you, you can't. No. no. Yeah, but uh, all, uh, there are other offices. I know my sister, for example, worked for IBM. In Brussels, it would be the same. You know, if it's an American company, you are micromanaged. So be Fantastic. be aware of that. Yeah. Fantastic. So, um, Dr. Ayo? Yeah. Um, again, uh, you know, I, I won't say that uh, the obvious uh, environment or culture should be too strange to any professional. There are basic things that I expected of you. Understand your job, do your job, and then uh, relate professionally. But of course, the aspect of culture chalk might be then where you need to learn and learn fast. Uh, because you don't want to present yourself as, uh, if you are a professional, you know, one of the things I realized really, even for me too, was that at a point I was trying to, to see how I could fit in and play, uh, you know, the way things should be done. But I realized I'm going to lose myself and I'm going to be, more confused. So I told myself, you're a professional. So what are the basic uh, office ethics? Whether, wherever you are coming from, first of all, remember that you're a professional and then oblige or, or work with the basic office ethics. Then what are the culture that you need to align with? You know, then the basic things. So yeah, of course, yeah, like she has said, uh, you, one, you can't even intrude to anybody's space anyhow. Mm -hmm. You are expected. You are expected to to be at your job post, do what is expected of you. Uh, you. This is not where you want to go around and start gisting, you know, or gossiping. This is where everybody is busy. That I, I remember one of the, you know, my, my my work experience. I I was going to just continue working, even though I've been told my thirty minutes break is not paid for. So. And not that I have things to do, but I was just like, okay, I don't even know when the 30 minutes should be. So I will just keep on working. And my colleagues told me, go for your break. Okay, you know, back home, you feel like the more you don't even go, maybe you'll be appreciated that being a good staff. Yeah, nobody, nobody bother about that. It's your break time, go for your break. And I feel even when you're break and then there's somebody call your attention for a certain job, you need to do it. You know, so tell the person I'm on break. So, mm -hmm. so if I'm break, you're on break. Nothing, nobody can discipline you for that. But you see, the apprehension that ah, I don't want anybody to say I have things to do. No, no, no. You're on break. And the person you also respect that for you. Okay, so 
uh, your your punctuality is important, and then follow the necessary process of your signing in, whatever you have to do. If you have to take excuse from work, do what is I mean, what is expected of you, and do it. Ensure that you get appropriate uh, permission and documentation uh, signed. You know, so just to be professional. All right. The the aspect of cultural shock maybe uh, how you you know back home maybe you could get a bit friendly with your your colleague, but some of those things are not here. So you need to be able to define the boundaries. You know, mm-hmm. you, need to, you, need, you, need, you need to know what are the things that are obtainable and not obtainable. And I won't lie to you. Of course, this is was in my work uh, environment, but it was one of the experiences I had. You know, in Netherlands, uh, I I got a friend, and then we were we just got called there, and then uh, we were going to part it. We everybody going to travel, and that was also. I mean, okay, so bye bye. We're going to catch up. Oh, I'm going to be visiting London. One of these, they drop your address, and then and then. The, and the person said, I'm making her feel uncomfortable just because I feel we're a friend. And I said, if I come around, I could pay a visit. And then it make, so I felt, okay, that's a culture. So I don't have to struggle with that. I just have to understand that, look, even though you're a friend, it doesn't still give you liberty to say that, look, I'm going to visit you. It has to be sick. It has to be requested officially, even though you have been friends. You know, so those are the things that are kind of be like culture shock. And then then you will explain culture chalk. And then I think what is important for you is to understand uh, how you adjust. I think your flexibility and the willingness to adjust. And, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we help you a, a great deal when you come to the work exp- environment. But the modern thing that I also think is important is that when you need help, seek for help. Now, don't keep it to yourself. Don't feel, don't, don't struggle in silence because at the end of the day, it will backfire. But if you really need help, seek for help, ask for it. Ask for it, and then you will get it. Thank you. Fantastic. I just wanted to add a few things. Some time ago, I read something on Facebook, and it was a Nigerian who came to the UK to, she relocated to work, and she wasn't feeling well. And she sent an email to, I think she didn't, she didn't inform her HR or her boss that she wasn't feeling well. And then they sent her an email to ask her why she's not here. And she said, I'm strong. Usually in our culture, when you're unwell, you don't say I'm not well, you say I'm strong. And they called her again and said, you're not here, what's happening? And she said, I'm strong. And then they called her a third time and she said, I'm strong. And she was sacked. (laughs) Because really what you're supposed to say is, I'm not feeling well and I can come. But then you know, we say I'm strong. It didn't make sense. So in this culture, you don't say I'm strong. You say I'm unwell. And so I can't come. And then there's also this thing about physical, setting physical boundaries. So um, like if you're talking to your colleagues, you have to give safe distance. Mm -hmm. You don't just, you, you can't be in the face of your colleagues. So even if you're sitting next to them, you have to give them distance and you can't touch people anyhow as well. It could be termed as harassment. So you have to maintain physical distance. You can't text a colleague over the weekend or at the weekend or very late at night. If you, if you do, you, you just have to apologize and say, I'm sorry. Um, I just need this, but ideally, you know, you have to understand those kinds of things, Mm. you know, so that's very, very important. So um, I don't know if I'm right. Uh, um, Rose, do you want to add to that? It's it's really about keeping um, work life and family life or home life separate, you know, private life and work life are two different things. And it can happen that you meet someone at work with whom you become good friends and that's fine. But before that happens, you know, it will take a while and just make sure that when you go to work, you're at work and then you go home and work has nothing to do with it anymore. And now also, actually, there's a new law that you can refuse to answer phone calls from your boss after work times. That's one thing you need to know. They cannot force you to work longer, especially now because people have since COVID, people have been working from home and they would be getting phone calls 24 hours a day. That's why they made that law. So you can now refuse to or just not answer phone calls of your boss after work time. 
Okay. Fantastic. Yes. Fantastic. And yes, somebody asked the question, can you have a recording of this? Yes, it's going to be on my YouTube channel, Ibnabo and Navy. And and whilst you're there, feel free to subscribe and leave a comment. Now, I want to ask another question quickly. What types of soft, soft skills do we need to acquire to advance ourselves? Rose? Mm, soft, it depends again from company to company. You know, uh, first of all, I would say check check out the company and see what kind of soft skills they, they ask because in, in um, job advertisements, there's always the hard skills, which are uh, your qualifications. And then there are the soft skills, which are um, being empathic, uh, loving, you know, liking to help people, uh, stuff like that. So, and then um, those are the things that are quite important here. But also, I would say, as a soft skill, it's being confident. Confidence is is really important, uh, and that is all to do with your yourself, but also with the others. So they know that when they ask you a question, they'll get an honest answer. Okay, it's all about honesty, confidence, um, empathy. That depends on the job. Sometimes you don't need it. <laughs> Sometimes you can just work on your own. Uh, so, but you really need to look at the job advertisements because that it's always mentioned in there. What what kind of soft skills they want? Okay, and uh, underline them. You know, on, on underline the hard skills with uh, blue and the soft skills with red, for example, and then you build that into your CV when you send the CV. So that's really important. Fantastic, and uh, Ruth. Um, I would say language, um, like that example where you just gave where this lady said I am strong um, when she yeah. meant actually that she is and well, um, it's very important to um, try and get as close to the language and I know coming from different countries, um, people have different accents and some accents are thicker than others and some accents are difficult to understand. Um, like, I mean, for me, I, I'm lucky I work in an environment. Um, Ibi, we can't hear you. You're on mute. You're muted. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, it's important that um, we get our language cleaned up and brushed up um, so that we can speak, um, so that we can be understood. And then also when, when you're in an environment, I mean, imagine working with, with an Irish nurse. Um, medicine is already a hard enough subject to understand. And then she's got this thick Irish accent, you know? So it can be very difficult for you to understand mm -hmm. also the information that you're receiving. Um, and then, so it's important, maybe just ask the person to slow down when they're talking because the Irish can talk really fast. Um, and just ask them to slow down. I don't understand what you're saying. And if you need to go back and ask questions, go back and ask questions um, so that you can get used to it. But don't be too stressed about language because with time you will catch on. Um, but I think it's important for us, especially for those of us, I come from an English speaking country, so that's why I sound like this. Um, Zambia was colonized by the British, so we grew up speaking English. So that is, that is a lot easier for me to exist in an environment like this. But for some people who come with a really thick accent where English is maybe even their third language, it can be a little bit tricky. So try and get your language and your ability to communicate um, actually like improve on that so that it's easier for you to actually get into these environments and thrive. Can I, can I uh, just yeah. come into that for, uh, very okay. quickly? Because that's one of the things I teach. I, I teach uh, Somali uh, asylum seekers when they arrive here about this as well. And please do not be scared because first of all, the employers and the supervisors also need to learn to slow down when, when migrants come in. So that's something that we want to teach them in workshops. And it's about intercultural dialogue. And indeed, some language is completely wrongly understood. Um, and that's one thing that we need to teach um, people who come in, but also the supervisors and, and the managers. And then uh, it's really important to ask them to slow down. 
to say from the start, I don't understand you. You know, I've been living here 25 years. I live in West Cork now. And if I see here two West Cork people talking to each other, I don't understand the word. You know, <laughs> that's how it is. Um, the accent is really, really thick and uh, just beyond me. So um, if and, I, and that's what I always give as an example to people here, to the managers. I'll say, well, just imagine if you come from um anywhere in in africa you just learn english in a school or whatever and you come here and, and you hear someone talk west carts and then they all start laughing and they understand immediately so they know to slow down and to speak standard english and you can ask those things you can ask fantastic so i teach english as a second language to non-native speakers and i have a lot of professionals who come from um, non-english speaking countries to come to ireland to study english and uh, a lot of them are professionals, lawyers, accountants, software engineers. And um, but sometimes they have to do um, cleaning jobs, security and stuff like that. So for someone who find themselves in this kind of situation, how, what, is there hope for them? Rose? Yeah, there certainly is, but it will depend a bit on them as well. So as I said in the beginning, uh, very often the confidence takes a deep dive of yeah. people and they need a little push, okay? And that's where, where we come in. Hopefully um, we can help some people, but it really does depend. Um, also, for example, as a lawyer, I know there's a lawyer here listening um, and he made it really very well but it's the courage that you need and sometimes it's also money but if you don't have the money but you do have the courage for example you could uh, look for a job as a paralegal in a, a law office and start because the the law systems are also different in in this country and other countries so um you could work yourself up there, work there a few years, get promotions there, and then you could, after a while, do an exam to become a solicitor, for example. You know, so there are ways. There are ways. There are also for engineers. The a lot of engineering companies really they need engineers, and they um, have now. They are offering apprenticeships, so they're paid apprenticeships for six months where even if you don't speak the language very well, you come in there and you work, you are shadowed by someone all the, or you shadow someone uh, for six months and then you can slowly start working on your own. You learn the jargon, you learn the English well. I've known a Syrian refugee who has done that and after six months they offered him a, a job. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah, so it is possible. It is possible and many, many... Uh, uh, companies, they need so many people and they don't have enough. So they are very willing to help you. Okay, so don't forget that. But it's working on yourself. Get uh, a little push in the back sometimes and, and, and find help, you know, ask for help. And there's enough people who want to help. And then also companies who want to offer you the, the way to get there. Okay, there's a lot of organizations in Ireland who help you as well to get ready again. But first of all, it's working, you know, it's yourself. Believe in yourself. You Fantastic. Fantastic. Now, I want to leave the, the mic open. And if you have any suggestions, if you have any questions, if you want to make any contributions, please feel free to do it. Or you can do it by just uh, using the hands up icon to let me know that you want to speak. Yeah, uh, but whilst we're waiting for that, I want to read out some comments that we have here. Um, someone is asking me, please, should would we have a recording of this meeting? Yes, we would have the recording on my on my YouTube channel, Ibn Abo Enebi. Someone says, yeah, excellent explanation on immigration is spiritual. I too can testify with Abraham who left his uh, people and country and moved to Genesis and moved uh, Genesis. And someone says, yes, the statement of immigration is spiritual. Yeah, well-spoken root, yeah. And uh, somebody says here, absolutely true. Someone says, uh, thank you, E.B., for that comment. Living abroad is not living in heaven. A lot of people back home get twisted and uh, and they think abroad is everything. So if you have any, yeah. So I have somebody here who has a raised hand and I am going to give you the mic. Yeah, so. 
feel free. I is it mic? Yeah, I'll I'll mute you now. Okay. Let me unmute you. Lower hands. Yeah. Sorry, I want to unmute you. Okay. So why you? Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Go yeah. Ahead. Let me unmute him. Unmute. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for this program. My name is Mrs. Denise Sika. Um, I live in, in, in uh, America, in Maryland precisely. And I have been in, in America for hmm, 30 years. <laughs> I work for the um, U.S. government. And my experience is that um, there is a difference between um, being arrogant and pride. Um, um, when I came into the workplace, I came into the workplace through a placement agency. And when I walked into that office, I said, this is where I belong. Now you have to understand that I was, I was young. Um, I did law back home, but when I came here, it was very expensive. So I had to change my education in doing administration. And um, I was trained in office administration. And this is where I specialize myself. But when I walked in the office, I worked in a center, a highly scientific center, working with doctors. And as soon as I walked in, I walked in feeling that I belong in this place. So I had to up my game in order to fit in. And within weeks of being there as a temp placed by a private industry, a private company, my boss at the time went to HR and told HR, do everything you need to do to keep her. I don't want to lose her. And I have been with the federal government until today, I'm getting ready to retire. So I'm saying that to say that um, even if we are immigrant, like Ruth said, it's a matter of destiny. When you are somewhere and your place is in that country, if you if you behave well, your place will not be replaced. You will not be replaced because mm -hmm. it's just a matter of um, walking into where you are assigned. But if you don't walk well, you can miss your assignment. And talking about work ethic, I was working with highly scientific, professional. And though I'm a native French speaker, when I came to America, because I studied in college, I took um, English and I love languages and I'm a reader. So one of the things I can say is read a lot. If you, if you are English as a second, uh, second language, read a lot. It's going to improve your vocabulary. It's going to improve your, your knowledge of the language per se. And then listen a lot because the diction is perfected by the hearing. So you have to listen a lot for, for you to pick up how to pronounce. Hmm. So you can be able to better communicate because when you communicate in a professional environment, you have to use the proper way of saying things to be understood. So um, just for my brothers there out there or my children <laughs> is to let, let you know that do not be intimidated. It's not arrogance, but it's confidence rather, not pride, but confidence. Be confident that you are intelligent, that wheresoever you are put, you can thrive. So all you have to do is learn the environment and adapt yourself and bring up your game, bring up your knowledge and make sure that you professionally sharpen yourself to be able to sustain where you are put. Hmm. Thank you very much. I didn't get your name now. Denise Seka. Can you type it for me, please? Okay, we'll do. Because you said something I, that I, I want to put on a quote. <laughs> yeah. Ruth <Brute> cited. <laughs> oh, oh, perfect. Thank you so much, Ruth. And Dr. Aya, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I, I want to say that... Um, there's nothing, there's no uh, a certain approach fit all. Uh, don't, uh, don't get too nervous. 
don't also expect that everything will be so rosy. Uh, it's a journey, but it, it has to be a journey with a purpose and uh, determination and uh, the aspect of willingness to adapt and uh, uh, be real with yourself. Uh, and again, like I would say to an average person, I said, look, uh, it is not a journey, you know, in, in, in Nigeria and a particular for Yoruba tribe, uh, those are Yoruba may be able to understand it. They will say, Aku uh, Eriyoko Deli. That means that uh, you will bring the goodies from your journey back home. All right. So, and I tell, I tell to people, look, uh, once you, if you migrate, yes, it's a journey, but it's not a journey to say, look, you want to live uh, a kind of a, a temporary life or a, a, a part of your life. And then when you return back to your home country, you will live your full life. I said, no, no. This is where you found yourself. This is where you have positioned yourself right now. Live your full life. Okay. If you have any reason to go back to your country and you want to continue your life, then move your life there and live your full life. So don't live half life abroad and then come back home to come and live another half life. In that sense, you might say you want to save, save, save so that you can spend that money back home. You're deceiving yourself because you're not going to have two lives. Okay. So what that means is that if you are migrated, if you have migrated or you are migrating, Focus on, on developing yourself. Focus on your life. That's where your life is now. Maximize your life. Live your full life. Do everything you would have ordinarily do if you are even elsewhere. Now, so don't live your life halfway and say, I will live my full life when I make all the money. Because you never can tell. It may just be that last journey, but that's the place you're going to fulfill your destiny. And then you're going to probably end it up. So why don't you live your full life? So if that is the consciousness, then what that means is that you're going to put all your best foot forward. You are not going to say to yourself, "Look, I'm just going to live a kind of a, a minimal life, a half-week life, uh, a, a temporary life, and then when I get back, no. If you got a job, put in your very best. Now, let it be that you are doing all that you need to do to position yourself. And then remember again, lastly, uh, much as it's about your personal life, it also have a, a, a place of representing your country or your tribe. Okay, because if you excel, if you succeed, they will not celebrate you alone. They will say a Nigerian Canadian. But if you also go otherwise, if you if you create problem in the system like root cell, if you if you negate all those spiritual intelligence she has doled out, and then you create problem, they will also say, if I did not say Canadian, you're just a Nigerian man. All right, because it have always have a link back to your where your base where you're coming from. So in essence, live your life, but be remember that you're not only just living your life, you also have kind of a, kind of an ambassadorial responsibility yeah. on you. Yeah, you think you're okay, so, Perfect. Yeah, so. Thank so you. That's, Thank you that's so That's important, much. yeah. Mm. Thank you. And does anyone else want to say something? If you want to say something, please uh, feel free to indicate by raising up your hand and I'll give you an opportunity to. And while we're waiting for that, someone says, I've been in Ireland for 11 years and what I learned the most is even if you get reassured by finding people from your country you will get more on the language and the work habits by mixing with people from the country where you where you are your level of english and confidence will improve once you get out of your comfort zone so that's very true isn't it and yes so who else uh if you want to say something feel free to to raise your hands up and can I say something there, uh, Ibi? Yes, please, yeah, yeah, I just wanted to come into that comment because I think uh, that's one thing that we've probably not mentioned. It's when you are here, um, join a sports club, join a choir, go out and walk with people because it's when you know people in Ireland, It's that's what people say. It's not what you know, it's who you know. Okay? It's who you know. It's who you know. So not only will you learn English, but you might find a job through it. Um, like I, I set up a, a cricket group, a cricket team with uh, the people from refugees from Asia, uh, because, you know, they're born with cricket in their head nearly. And um, one uh, guy, uh, so we, we organized the game against the local team. And now these people are playing with local teams and they found work that way. There was a man who came oh. to watch the cricket game because we talked about it on radio and he came to watch it. It was an old man. 
And he came to me and said, I've always played cricket. I said, well, I'll introduce you to the team. And I introduced people with the jobs they used to do before they became refugees. Oh. And one of them was an engineer. And he said, oh, my God, uh, engineers. Do you have engineers? I said, of course, yeah. They're all here. And um, he hired that guy. He, had, uh, he ended up being a man, a factory owner, a very rich man who owned a factory, who needed engineers, and he hired this cricket player. <laughs> oh so you God. never know what happens. You know, talk to people around you. Go and join things that you enjoy doing. Uh, sing in a choir, whatever. People will love you for it. And, uh, and if they hear of anything, they will want to help. That's the way they are here. Definitely. So there's a lot of people that come from home. Like I want to, I want to focus this attention on Dr. Ayo. A lot of Nigerian men have come to Ireland or have come to the UK or Canada or, or the States uh, to join their wives. They don't have jobs. Some of them are top banking executives. Some of them had gotten into the highest level of their careers. And now they have come to Ireland or the UK or Canada to join their wives. And some of them don't have jobs. How do we address that situation? Okay, so uh, of course it's a challenge, but the, the truth is that um, to start with, uh, the document, what document does the wife have? Does he give the, the spouse opportunity to work? And if, if that's the case, then uh, uh, you see, uh, the, the last speaker spoke about uh, the uh, the ego, the you know, the the feeling like, look, I'm a big man where I was coming from. And so, you are here with your wife. You have a new life, and you are in a new location or terrain. You need to seize the moment because you need to support. Even if your wife is working or schooling, you need to support her. So then you need to look at the skills. You see, and I will use myself as an example. I I have diverse skills, all right. So when I landed, I was hoping I could get my HR going, like I said. And I saw that I have a lot of things to do. So I look at the other things I could do. So until I, I got to the about the fourth of my area of, uh, you know, uh, skillfulness. And I felt, like, okay, so I, I've done a lot of facilitation lecturing job and all of that. So I just remember that I could, I could play that out. And that got me a lot of, uh, you know, interview. So you need to look at all of the areas of your skill set. And if you do not really see anyone that's relevant, then why don't you look for one? You must find something doing. In fact, there are remote jobs that you do from home, right? That may, you may also get headway. So there are a lot of things. The, the, the challenge is to feel like, uh, even if we have the money, for instance, you know, like I said to you, I'm about to sustain myself with a lot of my, my savings you know, back home, but you realize that the exchange rate is not going to even be favored. So that's going to be another challenge. It's almost like wasting money. But of course, you can use that to, to stabilize it for, for a while. But going forward, you must find something doing. So you, you need to you need to challenge yourself. And if there's the challenge of documentation, then you need to also understand what they can you do. How do you go about it? How do you navigate it the way to get your documentation so that you can get a job? All right, because it, it won't be too nice to become a body. It won't be too nice to not to say a non-entity, but at least to to make yourself uh, redundant. All right, it's not going to help you. Neither is going to help your family. So there's always that aspect of what can you do? And if you also look at it very well, because uh, you could also come up with ideas. So I mean, certainly look at the problems around and solve problems. And then come up with ideas and then do a business. If you feel you cannot work, okay, there will always be one of the things you can do. I mean, when I came around, I said that, okay, there are, there are a business possibility. But I said to myself, I'm not going to go into business now. I want to get into the system, work and understand the system. Maybe later on, I could start my business. So there will always be something to do. It's not going to be easy, but the fact is that push yourself. You just have to push yourself, push yourself hard, right? Because yeah. you got to get something doing. That's what I think okay. it is. And you know, the funny thing here, yeah, yeah, as much as people are passionately concerned, emotionally concerned, oh, sorry, nobody's going to be giving you money. Nobody's going to do that money. I, you know, back home in Nigeria, it's easy to give, Nara, give money, support you. Oh, yeah, I see nobody's bringing out any money to support you. They just want like, oh, sorry. The wires you can get is encouragement. <laughs> but money, nobody's going to give you a dime. So you have to work your ass out to get things done here. Yeah. All right. Fantastic. Um, let's hear Kate. Kate, uh, unmute yourself and um, 
please air your views. Unmute yourself, please. Yeah. Still muted. Oh, okay. okay, there we go. Um, I think I just want to add a few points here. Um, the first one was about um, immigrating, what happens when partners are left behind. If anyone, um, my husband and I came to Canada now 12 years ago, and I think the best decision we made was even though I didn't have a job or any prospects of work, we decided to come together. Um, I think immigration is hard enough on the people being left behind and the people who are starting a new life. But I think it's important to go through the struggles together because then you understand better. And it also allows you, like um, the gentleman had said earlier, for you to actually arrive in your new land and start living your life there. Because if your family is left behind, you're kind of still living half-half. You're still living in your home country and in your new country and you don't necessarily settle. Yeah. But I think it makes, it makes the process, it makes it understanding because if I'm back home, I would have all of these demands because like we've said, everybody thinks the moment you leave home, everything is, in, you're, the other people are in the land of milk and honey and mm -hmm. you have all of these ridiculous expectations without understanding the true struggles of what the person is going through um in their new land so if if you can absolutely help it i would encourage people to come as a family even if you're going to be sleeping on the floor and having one meal a day then you're struggling together then you're in it together um <laughs> the second point i'd like to add and it's, it comes back again and i'll speak from my from the perspective of an african woman if a woman migrates and she's the one with the job our African men need to change their mindset of being providers only financially. There's a lot of stuff you can help. You can be a helpful partner in a relationship, even if you're not providing financially. So this whole business of where the, how, the woman is the homekeeper, get over it. Start keeping the home. There's no reason why your wife should be paying for childcare if you're sitting at home and able to, if you don't have a... Uh, an economically viable job, when you can be looking after your children. When you're out in the diaspora, the support that we had at home is not there. The, the cheap labor where you can have nannies, gardeners, and all of that stuff is not available. And we have to help each other. So one person, the mindset has to change. You can't only be a provider financially. There's a lot of support that you can provide in the home. A lot of support you can provide your wife if she's the breadwinner. And when the opportunity pre presents itself where you can finally get out the house and go get a, um, and have a job that actually brings in money, then that's wonderful. But then the burden still, the, the dynamics shift from what it is when you're home with the entire support structure to mm -hmm. being in a completely different land. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's, I can't imagine how hard it is on the men because it's a knock on the ego. If their friends back home hear that, oh no, this man is the one now who's scrubbing floors at home. There's a whole thing. There's a whole host of ego issues that go with it. But the reality is that is helpful. If that's what your family needs at the time, as the head of the household, then do what your family needs at the time. And Fantastic. ultimately, I think it's beneficial to the family. Kate, and thank you. Thank you so can much. I, can okay. I add one more point? Okay, do um, that. I'm, with regards to cultural differences um, and how you manage the cultural differences in the work environment. I'll just give an example. Um, we had one of our colleagues who lost um, a daughter. And in Canada, families are very private in their mourning and everything else. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you've generally don't go just land you don't arrive at someone's house without knocking you know like mm -hmm. without making a plan I beg your pardon you don't just uh, um, arrive uninvited but a group in our African culture if there's a loss in the fam if there's a loss in the community you all just embark and you descend on these people's homes and I know a group of ladies and I and we had a bunch of uh, a group of Filipino ladies that I work with we just all upped and we arrived at the house. And while it's very un-Canadian to do so, um, our colleague was very touched and she was very happy. She actually couldn't believe that we did that because everybody was inundating her with phone calls asking if it was okay for them to go to her. 
but we just showed up at our house with meals and company. We offered to clean up the house and just, she was completely flawed. So while there's cultural differences, I think we have more similarities and more, our hearts and desires are all the same. She needed help. She needed support in that moment. She couldn't ask for it. And because of the culture we come from and how we mourn, we just rocked up and that was very beneficial for all of us because we helped her through the process. So um, while we do have our cultural differences, I think we should embrace, let's just treat each other with respect and how you would want to be treated. And more often the reception is of gratitude and appreciation than not. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, Kate. Kate, please, can you inbox me your email? Because I'm doing an episode on family soon. And I'd like you to please be a part of this conversation, if you don't mind. So, sorry, sorry, Ibi. I'm, I'm Kate's PR agent because Kate is my baby sister. So you will have no. to come through me. <laughs> she is beautiful. I would have thought I she know. looks like, yeah. Kate, I thank know. you so much. And quickly, I want to answer a question here. Somebody says, what tips do you have needed for skills that support immigration to the USA? And yes, I have an episode, EB Speaks episode 49. There is an episode there. So thank you so much, Kate. And I have somebody else who wants to add to the, wants to lend his voice to the conversation. Please uh, unmute. One second now. Can okay. you hear me now? Yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Now, I think most of the points that I wanted to come up with have already been addressed, right? There's a lot of things that I can relate to from uh, everybody that's been talking today, right? But what I just wanted to add now, I wanted to add uh, to more to do with the office setup, right? I myself, I'm, an, I'm a chartered accountant. I've been working in Ireland now for the last eight years, right? I've changed jobs, I think, about two or three times now, actually. But I see the experiences that I face in all the different workplaces has been very, very similar. You go for an interview, you get a job. In the interview, maybe there's like four or five people on the panel. You impress in the interview, you get the job. The moment you walk into the office, they, everybody kind, uh, kind of doubts you. They all like doubt and say, oh, he's a chartered accountant. Where is he from? Oh, from Africa. They all think that. You don't know what you're doing. You have to work for a few weeks, not even, even months, if not at least a year or more, before people can actually believe that you know what you're doing, right? So it, it's, it's very difficult now, especially you have the same qualification as everybody else at the office. When a client comes to you, we give advices to clients, right? Even the clients themselves, when they come to you, at the back of their mind is like, is this correct? You then find some of the people going to a different person and they get exactly the same the same solution. So it's a bit difficult. The other thing is, I do find that if you happen to be a black person, you happen, to, my job is very, I wouldn't say complicated, it's very simple, but there's very few people of my color that are working that job. So it becomes very, very difficult. My office there in Dublin, there's about 200 people in the same office. I'm the only person of a different color. Everybody there is white. So because of that, the focus is always on you, right? Sometimes people will try and help you when you don't need help. They feel like you are inferior, so you might be lacking on something. And it's very, very dissatisfying. It's very, very disappointing when somebody comes to you and say, oh, how can I help you here? So if you're not careful, that can actually bring you down. I've learned to live with it. But I, I can say this is one thing that I just wanted to add there as well, that you always doubt it until they know you very well. They always doubt you. So I think that's the only point I wanted to add. The rest of them have been covered by Ruth and Dr. Ayo. Maybe you on mute, my love. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Now I'm 15 minutes above time. And I don't want to overshoot, but someone <laughs> says here, for those who don't migrate with their partners, how can they cope with loneliness being the one of the causes of depression? I am doing a series on part, uh, migrating with partners. I'm doing a series on mental health. Mm -hmm. 
So just stay tuned and follow me on my social media handles and you would see when those episodes come up. And for everyone who's joined us today, I really do appreciate you now. And just quickly, um, Rose, Ruth at Isle, if there's anyone who wants to contact you for further information or help, how can they reach you? Would you be open to talking to people? Um, I could talk to people, um, they can send me an email to rose at recruitrefugees.ie. I'll put it in the chat as well. Uh, now, I can't uh, help people getting visas or I'm not an agent. I can only give some advice and, and referrals maybe, you know, so uh, because I get a lot of people asking me. How can I move you and find me a job? It's it's not that simple. <laughs> so, but definitely, if you have any questions around immigrating or whatever, I'm happy to to try and help as much as I can. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you, Ruth, and uh, thank you, Rose. Ruth. Rose. Um. Oh, right. Ruth. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. You, oh, people are welcome to contact me. I'll also drop my email address in the chat. It's simonzaruth at gmail .com. Um, and I'm happy to encourage anyone that's struggling, especially those that are in the asylum process. I have been there. I have walked the walk. I have talked the talk. Um, I am blessed because I met Rose and Rose was one of the people that kicked me out of my comfort zone. I had completely lost my confidence. Um, I was just a shadow of, of the person I used to be. And when she heard that as an analyst, I was mopping floors, she just would not stand for it. And um, she really pushed me and, and got, I mean, she's been one of the hands that God has used to get me to where I am. So I'm eternally grateful, Rose. <laughs> um, oh. So you're welcome to contact me and um, I'll, I'm happy to share my story with you. I'm happy to help you navigate that process and, and just encourage you. Um, and just one last remark before I hand over to Dr. Ayo. When you are in a foreign country, you made a decision to leave your homeland for whatever reason. Remember why you left. If you lose why you left, you're going to be physically here, but emotionally and mentally, you're going to be back home. You cannot move forward that way. You're going to struggle to move forward that way. And that's why, like Kate had said, it's important if you've got a family and you can all move at once, move at once because you want your heart in the same place where you mm. are because your heart is what is going to guide what you do in the country that you're in when you are in that country say for instance you left and it wasn't it wasn't by choice you had to run make peace with where you are forget where you come from and start a new start afresh a new beginning is always a blessing it's always a new way of doing things you would have made I had made terrible mistakes in my life in South Africa. I am never going to repeat those mistakes in this country. There's no ways. I got my fingers burnt in a certain way back home. I'm not going to come and do that here again. I learned those lessons. I have been afforded an opportunity to start again and to do things better, not as somebody who's naive, but now I have a little bit of experience. So use that to your advantage. Don't mourn your past life. Do not mourn it. It will do you no good. You are in a new place. Put one foot in front of the other and keep moving forward. This is an environment where if you are open to receive, you will receive, but you gotta be open. You can't live in the past. Your past will never let you go, but you have to say goodbye and move forward. Thank oh my you. gosh. Thank you so much. And Dr. Ayo, in case somebody has heard your story and is looking to come to Canada, how and would you and wants to get in contact with you? Uh, how okay, can you, yeah, all right, thank, thank you. I, I uh, put my email and phone number, WhatsApp number actually, in the box chat box. You can pick it from there. Uh, but again, uh, it, I would prefer you chat me or send me mail. I can share from my experience. And uh, if I feel I have some more complex situation than I have people also. I can, you know, refer you to, but I'm not running an agency. I, yeah, I, I know. I'm just right? purely, just purely a, a a passionate person that's also willing to 
you know, support the, the next person. So the, I'm not going to ask you to bring any fee, but uh, I think we can share some information. But again, like uh, every other person, my encouragement, my encouragement is that uh, be sure of what you want to do and then be be, be sure that uh, it may not look easy. Uh, and there's nobody really that I've had their story that I've related with that told me it's so easy. But at the end of the day, everybody has a testimony of a successful story, uh, of a progressive story. Uh, with doggedness, with commitment, you can get ahead. So I wish you all the best. Thank you. Can I say a last word? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, I forgot to say goodbye to everyone. So uh, this has been very interesting. I also uh, wanted to say to people who are here and uh, who know of other people who need help, uh, we are here to help refugees and people seeking asylum because uh, they need more help than anyone else, nearly um, in gaining confidence, in um, upskilling, learning languages and all that. So my email is there and uh, you're all very welcome. And as uh, Dr. Ayo said, please, please. Um, and as I said before, research, if you're going to come into Ireland or into any other country, research, learn uh, and research companies as well where you're and adapt your CVs very important <laughs> and um, I think it, it is possible it is possible to reach the heights but you have to work extremely hard and you have to be willing to ask people for help that is always necessary so uh, but you can do it thank you perfect so thank you very much and someone's quoting what uh, Rick said it says um uh, says here saying goodbye to your past is what some of us are struggling with. I needed to hear this. Thank you, Ruth. I'm a trustee of, someone says here, I'm a trustee of caste community and sanctuary seeker together in the, in, in the UK. We provide accommodation, immigration service, help people to integrate into the community. We do community projects to elevate loneliness. And Jennifer, you want, you want to please just Send me a DM on any of my social media handles, Ibn Aboy Navy at Instagram, Ibn Aboy Navy Facebook, and on my LinkedIn, and we've got to talk. Yeah. So, guys, if you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, please subscribe. It's Ibn Aboy Navy. And I'd like you to please follow me on my social media handles, Ibn Aboy Navy on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn, and on TikTok, as well as Twitter. And um, this has been a very exciting conversation. I learned a lot. And um, thank you all very much. And guys, uh, Faith, Rose, and Dr. Ayo, I'm going to call you and bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank yeah. you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yes, and thank you to all the contributors as well. Thank you. Bye. Bye.